So this particular lecture focuses specifically on the Bronson et al. textbook and chapter 13 in particular. The lecture was actually recorded back in 2018 as a part of the course when it was taught at that time. At this stage, I'll just turn it over to Dr. Clavo Hall and let her get started with the initial items, and then I'll come in behind with some of the information at the end. So we're going to get started a little bit on uh, looking at some dimensions of our lecture tonight and looking at measurement issues. And uh, at some point, you're going to learn uh, in what dissemination class, they'll talk about uh, run charts. Uh, so I want to say with, thank you, with these measurement issues, uh, this chapter is not about, thank you, not about the measurements themselves, like um, the Pareto charts and the run charts uh, and the graphs. Those are ways to display your information. This chapter is more about the issues that you may run into with, uh, with dissemination and implementation as you, uh, as you move forward. Let's see, here we go. So, uh, we're looking at a couple of, uh, a few of the objectives here. I'm going to look at some of the uh, outcomes measurements and looking at some of the process of measuring DNI and looking at kind of, as we've done a little bit here now, discussing some of the measuring outcomes and looking at some of the stakeholder information. And I think Sharon um, may have mentioned when she talked about her overview that there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies, wide ranges of how uh, terminology is used in um, measurements and outcomes. There's varied ways of how they uh, measure the construct. Some do it as we talk uh, in qualitative way using words, others in the quantitative surveys such as uh, I think Sharon mentioned gold standards. Somebody wants to make sure they're measuring using gold standards, but we talked about in prior weeks that that's not always possible. And then we talk about what do you think it's meant by measuring using record archives? So he's talking about retrospective information, for example, chart review. That means you're going back through charts that have been completed and you're looking at information. Uh, this goes to some of uh, your comments about your overview, looking at measuring processes lack rigor. Uh, I think that Molly talked about, well, there's so many uh, that you can choose from and then Sharon's like, there's they're out there. It's not that there's so many, but they are not detailed. They lack rigor. Uh, they say in your text that uh, few studies test the instrument validity. And um, has anybody familiar with uh, psychometric testing? Have you heard that term or know what it means? You're looking at it for people. And in research, psychometric testing is used to measure the uh, the instrument that you're using, of the survey that you're using, the tool that you're using. Psychometric testing there is the testing to see if the instrument that's been created, if it actually is uh, set up so that it will measure what it's supposed to measure, that the questions actually measure what you say you're going to measure, that those questions have been used in particular settings or with particular uh, populations to actually accurately collect the information that the tool, the research tool, said it was supposed to measure. You'll get to a point in your paper project, your EBP project, where you're looking for a tool and it's highly suggested that you use a validated tool, a, a, a tool that's been proven to be valid and reliable. Have you heard that term before? What we mean by that is usually when you find a valid and reliable tool that they've measured the Kronbach alpha 
setting for those questions to give you a statistical idea of how accurate they are, okay? And uh, I think I've mentioned to you before, when you read articles, see what type of tool they use in that article. See if it's something that would help you to measure what you want to measure and see how they used it. Because usually when you find a tool that's been used in a prior study, it's been validated uh, and it means that the question, the whole two individually and its parts has been, have been tested for accuracy to uh, ask the questions and collect the type of information that you want to collect. And that's why sometimes you will be asked to go and look for tools that you can use rather than you creating your own uh, questionnaire for your project. Okay, and that's why one reason why uh, the uh, John Hopkins uh, model and uh, the toolkit is a really good one because they have tools in that uh, in those guidelines uh, to help you ask questions about certain topics or references to send you to certain tools. Look for tools that you can uh, you can tweak a bit. That is what they're for. Okay, and yes, if you don't have the blanket permission, you write and ask. So then we talk again about inconsistency and we talk about heterogeneity being uh, a potential inconsistency. When we look at uh, actually using terms for implementation strategies, implementation outcomes, and we use different terms for similar uh, use that tends to give us heterogeneity that causes uh, confusion and makes it harder to measure outcomes when we're not using the same definition for the terms. And if you look, I think uh, it was in your book on page 264, we talked about implementation strategies, and they point out here where you're looking um, in the middle of the page where you had implementation strategies have been grossly dichotomized from uh, top to bottom or bottom to top. Look at that, that Magna Bosco empirically uh, identified 106 discrete state level implementation activities. How do you compare 106 implementation activities to see, you know, how they compare with, say, Lehman that has 14? Moving further down, you have the Epoch uh, Cochrane collaboration that has four types of strategies. And then you move down to uh, AHRQ that has five categories for implementation strategies. My question to you is, how do you develop a classification system, a naming system, to compare all of these different categories? True, but then when the next person comes along and tries to replicate what you did, what if something different fits for them? And then you get to, are we doing the same are we measuring apples to apples and oranges to oranges because of this large disparity in how the different categories stack up against each other? This is some of the inconsistency that leads to problems with measuring outcomes of the inconsistencies in the strategies. And so this is what they're saying we need to get better at standardizing so that we can be on the same page with our taxonomy and our naming and classification if we're going to actually be able to do any empirical measurements to try and one day possibly get to gold standards or even get to qualitative uh, outcomes measurements. So we're looking here, you have dissemination and implementation strategies. Uh, remember our 13.1 uh, framework? under implementation strategies. So we have a list, and this goes to some of what Molly was saying. Oh, we, we do have a list of many of them in some cases. So we have, this, this is uh, dissemination and implementation strategies kind of mixed together. 
And so you could say we have a list of them here, but when you go back to 13.1, how do you know which are dis, uh, dissemination, which are implementation, how many are overlapping and how they overlap? Uh, so sometimes if people will just use them uh, in a group here as dissemination and implementation strategies. But then when you separate them, is there a clean separation between them? Not always. So then in dissemination, it's uh, looking at the active approach of spreading evidence based on the intervention to a target audience via determined channels using planned strategies. So it's unsystematic approach. And then there's this thing called the push and pull. Do you remember reading about the push and pull of the dissemination strategy? And so you have the push from the organization and the system, but the organization can push all that it wants, but it needs to have some, some potential ad adapter reception. The, the pull is from the adapters, the employees. How many times do you have an organization saying, we're going to institute uh, this new measure, everybody must wear purple hats on Fridays, and we're going to do this, and this is the new policy. Organization is pushing. How much pull do you have if on Friday nobody wears a purple hat? Not much pull. The pull is the receiving of the push, and the receiving of the push is usually from the users, first line uh, adapters, the, the people actually doing the work. So you have to have this push-pull. And uh, so then you have the, the passive and active dissemination. And basically, you've learned from your, uh, from your reading that active dissemination is usually going to go over better than passive. And one example is here at the school, what we're doing with translating to the Canvas learning management system. You see how, uh, what is it? We're trying to go to Canvas. They have provided uh, the, the materials for us to use on Canvas, but they also provide support like Michael Barber's here, like the librarians are here, people to try and help you work with it so that you can learn how to use the new intervention yourself rather than reading about it or hearing about it, being able to use it yourself helps with dissemination. So that's on the dissemination side. Then you have the implementation side, and that's the process of putting it to use and integrating it in a specific setting. So here, uh, you're talking about implementing the actual uh, strategy, and they're looking at using uh, an individual approach to it, uh, looking at with um, Epoch and Cochrane, they usually look at systematic reviews to review a lot of a particular type of research and summarize it for you. And usually there is more science and research on the implementation side than there is on the dissemination side. And part of that is because implementation has more uh, terminology, more taxonomy that's established than dissemination. If you look at this, uh, this particular slide, we're looking at for dissemination, there is no specific list of terms. And there are some potential outcomes that you're looking at. But then you look at the implementation side, and you see a specific list of implementation uh, taxonomy. And with this, I'm going to ask you, as we close out, turn in your books to page 266, and you'll see table 13.1. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you looked closely at this table during the week or in your readings? Do you know what this table is about? He's comparing the list on the slide under implementation to the list on the far left, the first column of the table 13.1. 13 
So as you look at that, uh, he's right that a lot of the listings are under um, are under uh, implementation, and the few that are not under implementation uh, are actually dissemination. And look over to the third row. Uh, two things. You, you look in the second row and they're telling you, uh, and this is something for you to think about. This is what they're using when they're measuring uh, the individual level of analysis. What is your level in, of analysis when you're doing your project? Have, are you looking at individual changes? Or are you looking at organizational level of analysis or policy level of analysis? That's your project. When you think about it, think about what is it that you're trying to do? Let's say uh, in, in Molly's hypothetical case, we're trying to reduce faults. If I say, okay, I'm looking at the individual level of analysis, you look to the, to the left and you can see some of the outcomes that you might measure to let you know if your intervention is effective. If I'm looking at the ind individual level of analysis, I might want to look at uh, either in fact, almost all of them you could, you're looking at the acceptability uh, or at the individual level. That would be, do these nurses individually, are they accepting this intervention, this teaching? So I could um, measure my, my rate of acceptability. I could ask on my tool, how many of you are using the IHI training since I gave that training compared to before I gave the training? You could measure acceptability, or you could measure reach. Where do, remember, where do we remember seeing reach? In which framework? Re-aim, okay? And so here's a way you can use the re-aim framework when we talk about, well, what is your framework that you're gonna use? Here's some areas that you could use the re-aim framework. They're using reach, they're using adoption, they're using, uh, what was it, fidelity. So let's look at what level of analysis are you looking at and what you want to measure. If you choose one of these in the far left corner that you want to measure, that's letting you see you're measuring something in either implementation or, or, in, or dissemination, or it may be an overlap of both of them. And I'm going to skip all the way to the far right under example methods of measurement. Okay, so here I'm looking at uh, you see reach and survey. survey is the first one under, under acceptability and survey is the first one under reach. You see that? So this is telling you the types of tools that you might use to help you measure that acceptability or that reach and you're deciding which level of analysis that you want. And these are the things that you would describe in your paper. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, and so uh, with costs, they're saying uh, you're looking at, you're measuring administrative data. So instead of sending out a survey, usually the general public doesn't know much about the economics of a hospital. The, the floor nurse doesn't usually know a lot about that. But your administrative data, if you have access to uh, financial data of the uh, organization you may or you may be at an individual level where you're dealing with maybe the CFO or the charge nurse somebody who has maybe some insight on the economics of it so it's usually something it's not from a survey but it's usually from the organization's information that you might get that and uh, look under these theories here's the uh, diffusion theory uh, you can use diffusion of innovation. You can use observability. So when you're thinking about your project, look at these tools and how they tie together as you make up in your mind how you want to conduct your study. Okay, so this is a page Sharon said she dog-eared it. You may want to put a bookmark by it because it can help you bring together some complex uh, parts of your project that may seem scattered when you don't see how it can flow from beginning to end, okay? And if you start out knowing what you want to measure, 
you have some ideas here of how to measure it, frameworks that help show you how to measure it, and using this will help you better explain your approach to your project. Okay? Any questions? If no questions, with that, I'm going to say good night. So it was at that point that Dr. Clevel Hall had reached the end of class. They had a robust discussion at the beginning of class looking at where folks were in terms of thinking about their own uh, evidence-based practice projects or translational research projects. So the rest of the slides sort of complement some of the material that's in the book, although provided in a slightly different format. So for example, one of the things that is implied throughout chapter 13 are these different implementation and dissemination models uh, that you could have to achieve the different outcomes. And as Dr. Clavel Hall was finishing up on this slide, one of the things that um, comes next in the slide deck that she had prepared was you see that this is a specific implementation outcome model or method that uh, is presented for the purposes of evidence-based practice. So this particular model uh, is a way to achieve implementation outcomes, whereas this kind of model is a model that is more designed to achieve dissemination outcomes. And you can get into that notion of that idea of systems thinking that throughout the course, really from the very first chapters when you were introduced to different models of dissemination and implementation research and or different models of or frameworks of translational research and evidence-based practice, that's all been leading this idea of a systematic way of doing things. Um, the goal of which is to essentially achieve a level of fidelity in terms of the process that you are undertaking in order to achieve these particular things. So if you're looking at these four chapters in Bronson that you've been responsible for, for this week, you should be able to get the sense that that notion of these different models that we've continuously talked about throughout the course is part of a larger idea of giving you a, a specific system in which you can work through to allow you to implement your translational research or your evidence-based practice project from a standpoint of a high level of fidelity. So when you're specifically looking at measuring um, dissemination and implementation outcomes, there it's important to remember that outcomes and effectiveness are distinct items and there are a couple of ways in which they can often fail. Um, the first is that you often will find uh, you can have an ineffective intervention in a new setting. So something that was effective with a particular population or within a specific context, that when it is applied to a new context, that specific intervention becomes effective because of, ineffective, sorry, because of the differences in the two contexts. The other reason in which they can fail and that you won't achieve the outcomes or the effectiveness of a program or intervention isn't because the program or the intervention is actually bad. It's because the fidelity of the deployment has been low. So essentially that the intervention was deployed incorrectly. And those are some of the, the things that you really need to keep in mind as you are thinking about your own evidence-based practice project or your own translational research because you want to make sure that the level of fidelity is there. And that's why these models or these frameworks are so important. These systems become so important. The other thing that you want to keep in mind as you're looking at this is whether or not something is successful or the type of outcome that you're looking at and whether or not that outcome is seen as being effective or ineffective often is dependent upon the specific stakeholder that is looking at that particular outcome. So 
as you're starting to plan out your own projects, you want to make sure that you keep in mind the different levels that may be involved in the specific intervention, uh, the specific evidence-based practice that you are looking to implement. Um, is this something that is just uh, a personal thing? Is this something that involves just the floor or the unit? Is this something that involves the entire hospital? Is this something that involves the entire hospital system? Is this a policy aspect that may impact all of those individuals and may even impact at a larger level? You know, depending upon which of those areas an individual sits in, a stakeholder sits in, their preferences will differ considerably in the way in which they want to measure the specific outcome and the way in which they will determine whether or not that outcome is effective or ineffective largely depends upon the perspective that they have from who they are within the organization. So to summarize chapter 13 in particular, one of the key takeaways that you want to look at is that measuring effectiveness of an intervention or measuring the specific outcomes that are generated from a particular intervention can be challenging. One of the ways in which you can reduce that level of challenge is to use a validated instrument. So an instrument that we know is reliable and valid. That in and of itself can oftentimes be one of the most important decisions that you make as you pursue this particular translational research project. Another thing that will help in terms of the ability to measure the effectiveness of a particular intervention or the ability to determine the specific outcomes of that intervention is to follow a systematic approach. So a follow one of the specific models that uh, we've been looking at as we've been going through uh, the material that we've uh, looked at throughout the semester. As you begin to move forward in your translational research project process, one of the things you'll note is that the John Hopkins model or the Iowa model tend to be the dominant ones that you'll find going throughout. So I would become a little bit more familiar with those in terms of possible um, systematic approaches that you might take. And the more, not just standardized, but the more, the higher the level of fidelity that you can implement some of these standardized processes, these standardized models, these standardized frameworks, these standardized tools, uh, that will help you improve the quality of the translational research that you do.